Revivals come, revivals go. Outpourings come and they dissipate. What happens? Where did the revival, the outpouring, the manifested presence of Yah, where did it go? Hi, this is Barry Phillips, a 10-minute tour, day five. Okay, Sarah, the life of Sarah. Let's go to Genesis, or bear sheet, chapter 25. It says in verse number five, Now Abraham gave all that he had to Yitzhak. But to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts while they were still living, while he was still living, sent them away from his son Yitzhak eastward into the land of the east. And these are all the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. Verse number 11 says, And it came to be after the death of Abraham that Elohim blessed his son Yitzhak. And Yitzhak dwelt at Be'er Lahai Roy or the well of the living one who sees. <clears throat> so there is the, the restoration, the continuation of this living covenant that Yah has granted to Abraham and then will now be passed on to his descendants within a particular lineage, a particular line of descendants. There are choices that have to be made. Abraham has already had to choose between Ishmael and Yitzhak. Yah, for him, chose Yitzhak. And Yitzhak shall your name be called. Yitzhak himself is going to have to choose between two sons, between Esau and Yaakov. Yaakov has 12 sons to choose from. And the lineage continues, Yah making selections in behalf of these patriarchs and choosing how it is that he wants to raise up that which will become Israel. Israel is the covenant body among which Yah chooses to manifest his light, his glory, his manifested presence, um, the Shekinah, if you will. And so, there is also an understanding then that the Levitical priesthood is given jurisdiction and guard and covering wherever Yah's earthly manifested presence resides. One easy answer then pertaining to uh, why revivals come and they seem to go, where there is an outpouring of Yah's presence in the midst of us, there needs to be those who guard that presence. That is, that we protect Yah's, his glory. It's, it's, only, it's the best word I know to use. It's not a good word. It's not a great word. But it is a, a familiar enough concept. You, you and I can understand it together. When the glory comes, man tends to trample on the glory. The environment of the tabernacle was set up such that there was a linen wall of righteousness that surrounded all of Yah's manifestation through the, the particular parts of the tabernacle. And it wasn't just interpretive only. There was his light and his manifested presence within those confines. So much so that the priesthood walked barefoot properly grounding themselves, in a manner of speaking, uh, standing in such extended glory. One could only enter a prescribed way and according to certain protocols that we've talked about many times. The, the barrier outside this linen wall was the encampment of the Levites and their various clans. And it was twofold. It was to protect the glory of Yah manifested within the, the linen wall of the tabernacle uh, environment from those within the camp from just running amok and charging straight up into the presence without following Yah's prescribed procedures, his protocols. This is how you are to approach me. Further, the reverse was also true. They had a functioning role in keeping the presence of Yah from just wiping out and running rampant through 
the the community of Israel for whatever infractions. It is a glorious but also dangerous thing, perhaps, for revival to come. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. Ask uh, others who transgressed the glory. And so we look here, and it says that Abraham gave all that he had to Yitzhak. He blessed the concubines' sons, that would be Ishmael and the six sons of Keturah, but he sent them away because they would then not be in proximity to compete with Yitzhak for the benefits of the covenant that was not intended immediately for them. They could they could adopt and become a part of uh, Yitzhak's family, but oftentimes they choose to war and compete against him instead. It says then in verse 11 that after Abraham died, that the blessings that we can understand that were on Abraham became evident then in Yitzhak's life. And as we read in next week's Torah portion, we will see that that is also the truth. So then there is a need that we guard his presence because if we don't, whatever the presence is accomplishing will dissipate. There are a few reasons for this in the time remaining I want to share with you. One is that when revival comes, we seem to embrace it and encounter it with our preconceived understandings and doctrines. That is that we have our, if you want to use the word religious filters, our preconceived uh, understandings about how, how Yah moves and what he does and how he must do, uh, according to our previous experiences, and we filter whatever it is that Yah is doing through that. Well, I just never known him to move that way, or I just never heard him speak that way. Well, that's not the way revivals went when I was young. Well, we need to take all of our human restrictions off of the Most High and let him put his guard and guidelines upon us. Secondly, when revival comes, too often what has happened is that the merchandisers have shown up and they have sought to market it and merchandise it. And if there can be money to be made, even upon the glory, whether it's by pictures or other media, videos, recordings, audio recordings, however it is captured, uh, T-shirts, you know, such and such revival, on your T-shirts or your hats or your bumper stickers or you know, slogans that have been captured and, and recorded. Whatever they can do to make a buck, they're going to do that. But remember, Yeshua made a whip and drove those kind of people out of the presence of the Most High within the house of prayer. And he said, you have made this a den of thieves. Anytime we try to market or merchandise a move of Yah, you automatically should just close the doors and go home. It's over. And then let's also understand this. Why do revivals come? Well, it's for the salvation of souls. Well, that's that's a good that's a good uh, fruitful benefit, but it's maybe not even the primary benefit. The primary benefit is to get Yah's own people back into his presence and on their face in humility before him with a broken heart over their waywardness, even though they are his own people. So it is to bring us back to him. It is bringing us back to the integrity of his word, beginning with the Torah and then the prophets and then the Messianic writings, the Psalms, the Proverbs, all of these things become in balance. And Yah begins to speak with, to us in integrity and validity in his word again. And then it also recenters and refocuses us on his coming kingdom, which then makes us mindful of the land and the people who are currently in the land. All of these things are vital and in their important place. Let's ask for renewal, restoration, and revival and then act in response to it in such a way that it remains. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Laura and I ask that Yah's presence be with you, fill you, 
revealed himself to you through the study of his word and in the fellowship of those around you. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom. 